Um, I've been given 30 minutes to summarise the history of HIV for 30 years, so it's about a minute a year, and then we've got to look into the future work as well. So I will do my best and try and stick to time, because it's, I'm between you and lunch, I think, so um, we'll see how we go. So we have slides, which is great. Sam, thank you very much. Um, so these are AIDS quilts laid out in Washington, and they kind of serve as a reminder. A quilt is made when someone dies um, related to their HIV infection. They kind of serve as a reminder, this was just a couple of years ago, that HIV is still a major global issue. It's, it, it's, it's dropped out of the headlines a lot. You know, it used to be everywhere. It used to be on all the press notifications, and it was, you, kind of, you couldn't get away from it. But now it's dialed down. It's not quite as sexy as it used to be um, from a sort of you know, public point of view. But it's still a major problem. This map bears that out for you. 35 million people are currently living today with HIV, and they're not all in sub-Saharan Africa. Yes, a huge burden of disease there, but you know, there's 10 million people elsewhere, particularly in the UK, Asia, and other places as well, that we need to concentrate on too. The UNAIDS tell us two million infections carry, uh, new infections every year. The Daily Mail version of that is one infection every 15 seconds. Um, so, but this is, a, this is a real disease. It continues to grow, and it is something that we, we, we can't afford to take our sort of foot off the, the pedal and trying to control it. So let's go back to the very beginning. I, with this audience, I'm very aware that many of you will be very familiar with a lot of this. Hopefully, we'll, I'll be scratching the surface a little bit, for which I apologise, but then hopefully, as we kind of nearer the end and think about the future, we can get into a bit more detail. Um, undoubtedly, a zoonotic infection. Here are the, 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 the culprits. Pantroglodytes, troglodytes, the chimpanzee on the left for the main outbreak for HIV-M, then the sooty mangabe for HIV-2, for which Sarah, is, is, as an expert, has been the source of those. Many debates as to how it all crossed over from the animals into humans. Bushmeat seems to be very much sort of the favoured argument, and certainly the evidence is, is very supportive of that, and you can look at cut hunters and you can identify other SIVs in the blood of hunters working in Western Africa that haven't gone on to form epidemics, but show that transmission can occur when a very brutal preparation of bushmeat takes place and that blood products um, can be shared between the animals and the hunters. So that felt was lovely evidence sort of supporting all of that and sort of seems very clear now. So what happens next? Well, there's been a lot of work in, in that. Initially, Betty Korber, over 10 years ago, published some nice phylogenetic data on this. But then more recently, Oli Pibus and Nuno Faria, um, based in Oxford and elsewhere, have shown some very nice phylogenetic data and sort of other an analysis of, uh, of, of sequences from Western Africa around Kinshasa, showing this perfect storm of activity around 1920 to 1930 in Kinshasa, when the, the virus sort of crossed over from, from, from the, the, the primates into humans. And then in Kinshasa, as, as, as the town built, as the railway network built up, as people started travelling, as the sex industry got bigger, there was this perfect environment for an epidemic to take off and start spreading. And these are two very elegant papers which show that, and that show us around sort of 1920 that this really kicked off. So this, this virus has been circulating with us for nearly 100 years now. And then it all went a bit crazy um, when it's kind of, it, it hit the west coast of, Austra of, of, of America and it became the gay plague, the kind of, the, these, these, these dreadful news headlines. We've all got our sort of favourite slides of, 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 of dreadful press reports. This is one of them um, from Zimbabwe. And this is particularly um, compelling. What I propose is government should compel women to have their heads clean shaven. Um, so they shouldn't bathe either because there's all these sort of things that are in, in, inspiring increased sexuality. So there's a lot of craziness going on. Um, and a, and, a, and the, the, it needed to be brought back and some sense to be made of where we went forward. So the epidemic grows for it, people get infected. Around the early 1980s, we start to find drugs that work. Initially, AZT was on the shelf, a cancer drug that wasn't particularly effective, and that looked in culture as though it might work. And though the early days, some of you may recall it in the 1990s, when AZT was handed out as monotherapy, patients did well for a bit, but then the virus rebounds. And there was a lot of doom and gloom that we won't be able to deal with this. And then two drugs were available. And so two drugs were given. And again, the patients did well for a bit longer, but then the virus came back. And then the real breakthrough came in around 1996 when the protease inhibitor class came through and three drugs could be given. And by giving three drugs, that seemed to be able to suppress the virus for a persistent duration. And as the drugs have got stronger now, for the duration potentially of the lifespan of the patient. And this has been a real revolution. And I think the last sort of 30 years, certainly in drug development, I think, you know, when we talk to med teach medical students about this, I, th I, I feel that kind of the development of antiretroviral drugs is one of the major medical breakthroughs of the last 100 years in terms of the impact that it's had on people's qualities of life. And it has been dramatic. Regimes now standardly contain three drugs as a, as a standard cocktail, the idea being the virus can't have enough mutations on board at any one time to be able to become resistant to all three drugs, and therefore that it'll work. 
We aim to suppress virus in the blood to undetectable levels. That's the clinic test. And actually, cl HIV clinics, which I run as well, have now become quite dull in some ways because everyone is doing so well. We take their blood. They're all undetectable in the plasma. Their CD4 counts are doing well. I mean, it's fantastic news, but the drugs are that effective that it's brilliant. Um, CD4 counts are now rising and people are doing very well. But the bottom line here, which is what we'll get on to, is that it's not a cure. And the drugs have been getting better and better, and it's been really dramatic. It, it, I'm afraid the font's a bit small here, but the principle is each one of those lines is a drug that is available for the treatment um, for HIV. So we've got Zydovidine, I don't know if this cursor works, we've got Zydovidine right back here in the early 1980s, and this incredible growth of drugs. It's like an epidemic of drug discovery. Um, and now we've got these agents like Dolitegravir, um, which is an integrase inhibitor, which is so potent on its own that so some of the, the work that's gone into that suggests that you may not even be able to get resistance to this agent on its own. I mean, that's debatable. But the point is these drugs are incredibly potent. People are now talking about giving a single agent potentially just to treat HIV. I, th I don't think we would be brave enough to do that quite yet. But that's sort of the way things are moving. The drugs are getting so good that we're expecting control. And life expectancy has been impacted enormously. So this is data from UNAIDS. And so you know, an uninfected person from the age of 20, on average, would live around sort of 60 or so years. Back when we, in the 1990, early and late 1990s, when there was only sort of, only sort of single agent drugs available, you know, life expectancy was poor if you're HIV positive. But now, as we've moved forward to the current era, we're telling our patients who are newly diagnosed and going on to therapy at the right sort of time that unless they have any other major comorbidities, that their life expectancy should be the same as if they were HIV negative, which is a really important message to get across to the patients. You know, it is worth taking these tablets because it's quite a burden to have to do that. I don't know how many of you, I suspect all of you, have taken a course of antibiotics at some point. You know, if you, if you, if you, you were told you had to take those every day for the rest of your life, that's quite a burden, especially if you're a young, active, you know, 19-year-old gay man in London. You know, that, that, that thought of every day from now on, I'm on medication, is a huge burden to take on. So if you can tell them that your life expectancy is going to be the same if you can do that, it's a major impact. So treatment is fantastic. HIV positive individuals, they go on to therapy and it works. What are the other aspects of therapy that we might want to think about and how else is it being used. I just want to cover two important papers that have come out in the last few years. One is this treatment as prevention. This was a major trial that was undertaken by Mike Cohen, um, questioning the fact that if you, if you had an HIV positive partner and you were an exposed, uninfected person, would you be protected if your partner was on therapy? You know, if your partner had an undetectable viral load and was, was doing fine from that point of view, would you as the HIV negative partner be protected? And the data was overwhelmingly yes. And this concept that we can use therapy not just to treat the person who is positive, but also to protect the HIV uninfected people in the community has been a major sort of step forward. I think we all expected it virologically. You know, you shouldn't be able to transmit, you know, from the virological point of view. But to actually see that happen in the community in real life, where, where sort of the, the patients are infected, was, was, a, was a major finding. And, and I think this paper has been a major breakthrough in understanding what else therapy can do. So I think that's, that's acceptable and understandable. We all know about that. A little bit more controversial, and this kind of makes a lot of headlines, is this concept of pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, and you may hear about, a lot about this in the future. And the FDA have recently um, licensed a drug called Truvada, which is a combination of two um, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, to be taken in HIV-negative people who think they're going to be exposed and put at risk. Um, and this has sort of raised a lot of eyebrows in, in, in some cases. And, you know, the Daily Mail type people get very upset about this. Other people think it's OK. The question is, you could just use condoms. Why do you need to take drugs to prevent yourself getting HIV? But this has become a big issue, and there's a lot of push at the moment. There's a, there's a very big um, pressure group so that the NHS should be making these drugs available for HIV-negative people who think they're going to be at risk that night if they're going out clubbing or they think they're going to have sex with someone who might be positive, that they should have these drugs made freely available so they can protect themselves in the event of exposure. So that's interesting, very much in the headlines at the moment and something I'm sure we're going to hear more about and very much divides a lot of the field. I think there are certainly cases for it in, amongst sex workers and other people like that when, in, in industry where you know we need to make sure that the protection is, is, is provided. So that's a big issue. So where are we today in the United Kingdom? Some of you will be familiar with this report that came out just before Christmas and actually made some headlines because it was the first time in the UK that we now have over 100,000 people um, living with HIV. I think it's around 107,000 are living with HIV in the UK. And it's the, the groups that we would expect, men who have sex with men, African people who've come here, 
often infected in Africa and now living with HIV in this country. But there's some striking data um, within that, that that I think is just worth highlighting in terms of thinking of the future of what we need to do in terms of service provision for HIV. Because this is new HIV diagnoses over time, and you can see that actually, as one might expect, it's been starting to decrease overall. There are some at-risk groups where it is possible that HIV incidence is on the way up, and certainly in some groups of men who have sex with men, particularly in London, there is a concern that incidence is on the increase. And there'd be sort of educational reasons around that. Certainly, anecdotally, a colleague of mine who works in Dean Street Clinic in Soho has young men coming to her who don't even realise that HIV is sexually transmitted. And if, if that's the level of some degree of education, then it's, it's a community of physicians and health workers, we're doing something wrong if we're not educating them that well. But incidence overall is going down, but it is still there. You know, 6,000 new infections a year in the UK. As we know, AIDS and deaths are, are very much on the decrease, and um, you know, people are living a long life. But this gap here is important, because people are still getting infected, and they're living, and they're living a long time. And we are growing a community, and we can see that in the HIV clinics that I'm sure some of you run, of older patients living with HIV. And there are certain comorbidities associated with HIV that seem to be important. There seems to be an increased risk of dementia, possibly an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So having HIV may have some equivalence of smoking. And we're going to see an older population with HIV that we aren't actually quite prepared to think about and, and deal with yet, and it's something that needs to be much more brought forward into the mainstream. And this is going to get increasingly worse over time as, as, as people live longer with their infections. So we need to take account of that. The other thing that is very important, again, some of you will be familiar with this, and I just highlighted the, the left-hand column here, which is men who have sex with men. So of, of the people living with HIV in, in the UK, a quarter of them don't realise that they're positive based on anonymous surveys through GU clinics and other sort of modelling. And I think that's striking. You know, if, if a quarter of people who, who are positive um, don't realise that, by definition, they are at risk, not only of, of, of being infected with HIV, but by passing it on in view, in view of the fact they had it in the first place. And we also know that the earlier you treat HIV, the better you do. If you turn up late with a poor and low CD4 cell count, you do much worse than if you start early. So this statistic has driven a lot of interest, particularly from Sally Davis and others trying to say we, need, we really need to get out there screening young people who might be at risk to try and identify those who are positive and, and, and get them onto therapy. So that's where we are with that. And, you know, the epidemic is growing and it's still present. But what about the future? What, what, what's the future going to look like now? I think, you know, we, we, we've reached the end of one chapter. We know antiretroviral therapy works. We know that patients will do well. They'll say, as I said, they'll have normal life expectancies. But is that enough? And I think it's a question that we, kind of, we have to ask ourselves as a medical and scientific community as, as well as in patient groups. Are we okay with that? You know, can you just tell someone, right, you're on therapy for life now and that's it? Or is there, does there need to be an effort to try and do better and look further? And there's, there's a big push to suggest actually that there, there is room to look further and see if we can do better. A colleague of mine, uh, Judy Fox, who works at um, St Thomas's, helped run a survey of 1,000 people who are HIV positive, just asking their views on it. What's it like to be positive at the moment? What's it like taking your tablets um, at the moment? And it, it was quite striking, some of the answers that came back. I mean, some of it, yes, of course you want to be HIV negative if you are positive, but it, it is interesting just in terms of what people would take on and what risks they might take on um, if, if a cure, you know, out there on the horizon became a possibility. I thought this one was particularly telling, a white female from Bulgaria, who just said, after 15 years, I'm quite tired of taking these tablets every day. You know, many years ahead of taking them. Adherence, we know, is absolutely critical. And yet, if we can't maintain that, then we're going to run into trouble in the future. So cure has become, you know, a very hot topic in the HIV community. And it tends to bring out the nutters. So we have to be quite careful, you know, in, in terms of how we report, and lots of stuff gets misreported. Um, this is the case of the, the Gambian president, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, who reported he had a herbal cocktail that could cure HIV. Actually, as the upside of that, many people came forward to be tested for HIV in the Gambia. So there was an upside to that. If, if you're on Facebook, five people like that. Um, <laughs> so so what, why does it matter? I think, you know... There are virologists in the audience. You can't cure HIV. You know, we know that, don't we? Um, if you stop your antiretroviral therapy, the virus comes back, and it comes back quickly. You know, this is, this is days on the, on the x-axis here of people who were taking antiretroviral therapy and stopped. You know, and it comes back to high levels. This is log on the x-axis. You know, millions of copies of virus per mil of blood within a few days of stopping your antiretroviral therapy. It's sitting there waiting to come back. You cannot supposedly cure this infection, and you have to stay on therapy for life. Just as a summary, many of you will be familiar with this, but for those who aren't, why can't we cure HIV infection? Well, here's some viruses wanting to infect some CD4-positive T cells. The cells we always worry about are these ones on the right. 
Here the virus has infected the cell, it's become integrated into the cell and it will produce new virions, it will produce antigen and it will be you know, visible to the immune system which is pretty hopeless at, at, in most cases at, at controlling it and new viruses are produced. This is where all our drugs work, the reverse transcriptase inhibitors, the protease inhibitors, the integrase inhibitors, they all work on this cell here. However, there's another cell and this is where latent infection occurs. So the same process happens, the virus infects the cell, it integrates its DNA or RNA and then into DNA into our own chromosomes and then that cell becomes, for want of a better word, latent. It is non-activated, it doesn't express any viral antigen, there's no sign of any HIV transcription occurring within that cell and it is essentially in, in, invisible to the immune system. And these cells can wake up at any time. What wakes these cells up is not clear. But they can wake up for, for at any time, they can proliferate homeostatically and persist for the lifetime of the patient. And it is these cells that result in the release of virus when therapy is stopped. The question is, you know, why do those cells wake up and why do they produce virus so quickly? Where are they? We don't even know which anatomical compartment they're in. Are they in the blood? Are they in the lymph nodes? Are they in the brain? In the gut? Um, in the GU tract? Probably all of those places, which makes them a, quite a, a, a tricky thing to find. Collectively, these latently infected cells are called the reservoir. Again, we don't really know what the reservoir is or how to measure it, but the conceptually, the reservoir is this collection of latently infected cells. And the assays that we do have, we can apply, however loosely, to measuring the reservoir, are actually very predictive of clinical progression. I'll show you some data later, so saying that kind of how we, when we measure the reservoir, it's actually a very useful thing to do and may in the future and be more telling. And there are a lot of issues around how we now deal with the reservoir, which I'd like to sort of present to you over the next sort of few minutes of this talk. So, in terms of cure, N equals 1. Um, this is Timothy Ray Brown, who sort of gave up on his anonymity after he was cured with his stem cell transplant. I think, I suspect everyone knows about Timothy Ray Brown, not only the people who work in, in garages and the co-op, but everyone else know about Timothy Ray Brown whenever I, you know, we get a chance to talk to them. And he actually, if, if you're interested, you know, he's just published this in AIDS Research in Human Retroviruses. It's a personal account of what it was like for him to go through everyone and be the, you know, the first person in the world to be cured of HIV. And his story is, is very compelling and it's very interesting. And there are a lot of lessons that we can take away from that. For those who are not familiar with him, this was an HIV positive man. He was um, he'd been diagnosed uh, 10 years before presenting to the haematology department with acute myeloid leukemia. He was doing well on his antiretroviral therapy. And as a result of his, his leukemia, he, he'd had a, a course of chemotherapy, but that, that had failed, his, his, his leukemia had come back. And then they decided he needed a stem cell transplant. Because of his HLA typing, they found loads and loads of potential matches for him. And so Jero Hutter, who was the haematologist who was looking after him, said, well, maybe we can find someone who is Delta 32. Because CCR5 Delta 32, this mutation in the CCR5 gene, prevents infection with HIV. And if you're homozygous for that, you are resistant to HIV infection. So the idea was, Jerry Hooter thought, well, if I can cure his um, acute myeloid leukemia, I might be able to cure his HIV at the same time. He went for the double whammy. And actually, although it nearly killed him, and you know, it really did nearly kill him. He had a terrible time with various sort of opportunistic infections. He had, he had an acute brain injury, he had renal disease, hepatic disease. Um, he came out of the end of it and his viral load, as this line here shows, the red line here, this, is, this was the time of his first stem cell transplant. And they stopped his antiretroviral therapy as he had his transplant, and the virus never came back. He's now living on the West Coast um, and is looked after by a, phys a physician called Steve Deeks, who's biopsied most of him. You know, <laughs> he's biopsied lymph nodes, tonsils, gut, and really there is very, he can find no evidence of any persistent <coughs> HIV in this patient. He is, he is HIV negative, he has been cured of his HIV, and that is dramatic, N equals 1. But nothing since then in five years. And it's been a tough time, actually, for the cure field. I mean, this, this is the way it goes, because there, there were a lot of false starts. So you can give someone a Delta 32 transplantation and cure them from their HIV, can't you? That's easy. So here he is, the Berlin patient up at the top, 40-year-old male, acute myeloid leukemia, seven years after transplantation, alive and well, HIV negative. Here are six more patients who had hematological malignancies, who were matched for a Delta 32 CCR5 transplant, all six of them have died um, following this. So this is not a straightforward thing. This is a, an example out there on the periphery. You know, you can cure HIV if you take every possible risk you can imagine. Yes, these patients had hematological malignancies, so, you know, possibly different from someone who didn't and trying to do this, but the, the risks involved are enormous. You know, it proves principle to the virology crowd you know, that you can cure it if you get all the conditions right, but you are so far out there in terms of the spectrum of what you can do 
that you know, this is not something we can take forward. But it gives you something to work on. So what happened next? So, there was a, so the Berlin patient got everyone excited. Other people thought, well, I'll try and cure some individuals as well. And there was a case of the Mississippi baby that some of you may have heard about. Um, it, again, it got onto the media, you know, people being interviewed on Newsnight and the news about this child. Um, and this was a, a, a very interesting story, actually, because it was a child who the mother led a very chaotic lifestyle. She's an intravenous drug user, and, and this is actually a story of failure of antenatal care in the US, because she turns up in labor in Mississippi. She's never been tested for HIV. They test her in labor. They find out that she's positive. The labor is progressing really quickly. They have no time to give any prophylaxis to the child. So the child is born positive. And at 30 hours, the child starts on three-drug antiretroviral therapy, transferred to the major medical center in Mississippi, where therapy is continued. Child responds very well. Viral load in the child comes down. It's undetectable. And the child carries on therapy for around 18 months. And then the records show that prescriptions stopped being picked up by the mum. She stopped attending. She then stopped attending her physician and went missing. She then appears around sort of two years after the child had been born, saying, I've not been giving any treatment to this child, and it doesn't need it. It's fine. And then we looked, well, I didn't look, but Debbie Persaud looked for, for HIV in the child, and actually, right at the lower limits of the assay detectability, there was a hint that there might be something there in some of the monocytes. But really, this, this was felt to be negative assays, and the child was remaining undetectable. And you don't get elite control phenotype in children, so I understand. You know, in, in adults, sometimes you see people who can control their HIV. You don't get that in neonates and perinatal infection. Yet this child was somehow remaining undetectable despite being off therapy. And this was heralded as a cure, and everyone thought this child was cured. And as you may recall, last year, and this is Debbie Passot who looked after the child, um, the virus came back in the baby. She described it as being a, a punch in the, in, the, in the stomach. You know, she thought something quite dramatic had happened with this child. And actually, other children around the world at this time, people started thinking, well, let's get in early and really treat high-risk children. And there were, num there were a few cases where they thought, maybe we've cured someone. So the Mississippi child rebounded. A child in Italy, also thought to be cured, rebounded. A child in Canada, also thought to be cured, rebounded. There are no children you know, who have you know, been born, put on therapy, who've, who've been able to come off their therapy and remained aviremic. So this is a big blow. You know. Not necessarily surprising. You know, I think we were surprised that it did work with a Mississippi baby. But the duration, that period of remission, tells us something. Something different happened in that child. Because you know, to remain off therapy for two years and be aviremic you know, is striking. Something was going on with that child because it wasn't necessarily the immune system. So this then brings us to the question, well, when we're talking about HIV cure, what do we actually mean? And this is one of the, kind of the reasons we asked the patients what they wanted. We have the, kind of the infection model, you know, what we think of as ID physicians and, and scientists as a cure. You get rid of the pathogen. And this is the Berlin patient. You know, he's aviremic. There's no virus left in him. More and more, we're starting to talk about a cancer model of cure, where we're talking about remission. And the idea, which looks increasingly possible, and there is evidence for this, is that patients can enter a state in which they come off therapy, they remain aviremic for a persistent duration of time, you know, for prolonged durations, without having any therapy whatsoever, and the virus is not coming back. And I'll show you some evidence, because this shouldn't happen. I showed you that slide earlier that said the virus comes back in days. Well, there are some patients, well, that doesn't happen. I just want to tell you a little bit about those. And this is the concept of post-treatment control. Um, and this is very tantalizing. And there's a lot of debate in the community at the moment. Is, is this real? You know, virus comes back when you stop therapy. But in post-treatment control, it doesn't. And the data for this comes from a, a study called the Visconti cohort in France. And this was just a, a, a sort of a ramshackle cohort of patients at, at first, where someone told one of their friends, Assier Sirius Sion, that he had a patient who'd come off his therapy and the virus hadn't come back. And so Assier looked around and found some others. And actually, he found a, quite a few patients who'd been treated very early in infection, and this was the key. They'd been e treated in primary infection, they'd been treated for a prolonged period of time, at least a year, many cases longer, and then they'd come off therapy for various reasons, you know, not generally advised, but they'd chosen to come off therapy and they hadn't come back. And this, this, this next slide explains it. Bear with me while I explain why it looks so hideous. Um, each row here is, is one of the Visconti patients. And if I just highlight this bigger slide. So this was the time on antiretroviral therapy they had from the moment of infection. So they were diagnosed and they went quickly on to antiretrovirals, which is against standard guidelines. Normally we wait for your CD4 count to drop to a certain level and then treat. But these patients went on to antiretroviral therapy. Here's kind of the, the, the number of months they had of therapy down the bottom, if you can see it, 36 months. So an, a median of three years of therapy from the moment of seroconversion. And this is the time they have been off therapy. 
um, since that moment. So 82 months, 100 months, 107 months. These patients have been off therapy for years, and some of them have now been off therapy for nine or 10 years um, without having to go back on. And this is incredibly unusual for a virus that's supposed to come back in a few days. Are these patients cured? Or is this a remission? Is the virus going to come back in them? That's the big question. You know, and we don't actually understand what on earth is causing post-treatment control. Because what they're not is they're not elite controllers. Many of you will be familiar with the concept of the elite controller, a patient who becomes infected, definitely positive, mounts a fantastic immune response, but remains undetectable. Less than 50 copies in the blood, good CD4 count. This is not happening in these patients. They are completely different. If you line, line them up side by side, these are the elite controllers here making fantastic immune response. They've got lots of really good HLA class 1 alleles that help you target HIV. Post-treatment controllers are different. Their immune responses are rubbish. You can almost detect no CD8 cells um, functioning in them. They don't have any protective HLA class 1 alleles. Low levels of activation. Um, and they have very, very active... Um, Seroconversion illnesses, this seems to be a feature of it. You know, they are very unwell at the time of infection. Now, is, that a, is that a bias? Do they come forward and get treated because of that? You know, that's not entirely clear. Um, it doesn't seem to be the case. And the French cohorts suggest that around between 5 and 15% of patients treated early can enter this post-treatment control status. I suspect that's much too high, but actually we don't have, have a clue. But looking at other cohorts retrospectively, this is real. There are definitely patients out there treated early who can then come off therapy, which breaks the sort of the rule of HIV. That's not supposed to happen. So that sort of opens up a whole new area of things. The question then is, can you predict this? If you have a patient who's on therapy who started early, can I say, you know, you can come off therapy, you'll be fine? Or, or actually, is it a completely grey box? And I just, there's a, a, just to highlight, summarise a little bit of data from a trial that we did called the SPARTAC trial, which was actually set up for a completely different reason. We didn't know whether it was good or bad to treat people in primary infection, so this trial randomised patients to do that. But one of the advantages of SPARTAC is patients were started on treatment very early, they were then put on a year of therapy in one of the arms, and then it was stopped, and it was all randomised, and they were followed up after stopping to see if they did well. It wasn't anything to do with cure at the time. It were different questions were being asked. But retrospectively, you can go back now and say, well, did that year of therapy do anything useful in Spartac? Did it create any post-treatment controllers in this country as well? And the answer was no. No one remained undetectable for a, a prolonged period of time. Everyone rebounded in the end. But what was interesting was that a year after stopping therapy... 14% of the patients were still undetectable. They were controlling for a year. They had a, a brief period of remission, which, again, is, is not supposed to happen. This is completely different to chronic infection. If you treat late, the virus comes back straight away. And one of the things we thought we'd do, we'll, we'll, we'll try and measure the reservoir in these patients and measure how many latently infected cells they have, because maybe that helps you predict what's going to happen. So we measured the HIV DNA, both integrated and total, in their CD4 T cells. And it was striking. So first of all, in terms of, sort of good and bad HLA class alleles as, as a sort of a top line for where they're making good immune responses, the DNA levels and your beneficial HLA class 1 alleles congregate very nicely. So we kind of highlighted rather subjectively, but based on you know, good data, that the, the good HLA alleles are in red here. Sorry. And they're associated with much lower DNA in the patient. So we think early on it is, it is the immune system that is setting the size of your reservoir, but then actually the immune system drops out and doesn't do very more. And we know that if you measure the DNA at the point at which you stop therapy now, it predicts time to viral rebound, um, and quite accurately. So if you know the size of the reservoir, you can say to the patient, actually, if you stop therapy, your virus is going to come back straight away. If it's very low DNA, there's a chance that actually you may, might do quite well. And this holds out in a number of different analyses. But it does look rather stochastic. And it does look, so this is, uh, with this audience, I'm not going to call this a model. It's, it's a picture. Um, but, the, but the idea is here, here's, the, here's this black box of this thing called the reservoir that we don't quite understand, and we think we can kind of measure, but we're not sure. We're using this as a surrogate mark, and the, the, the Venn diagram is deliberately only just overlapping. We think it hints at it. Virus sets the reservoir. We're pretty sure that T-cell immunity is, is inherent in determining the size of your reservoir, probably in the very first few days and weeks of infection. You then go on to your antiretroviral therapy. Everything becomes undetectable. And then you choose to come off therapy for whatever reason. And then two things happen. One is the virus comes back at some point, And the other is that you clinically progress. Your immune system weakens, your CD4 count declines. And we think that these are two completely different processes. 
We think your progression is controlled by your immunity, but actually when the virus comes back, the time to rebound looks completely random. It look, looks completely stochastic. And in Sparta, what is interesting, those two values don't correlate at all. You, know, you can come back early and progress quickly or come back late and progress slowly. They seem to be very different parameters. And so we hope to look into that further in the cohort called Heather, which we're setting up at the moment across the UK. And we already have around 160 patients treated within a few weeks of infection. They are now up to sort of two or three years on therapy. And at some point, we're going to stop their therapy. And that's a bit controversial as well. You know, can you stop antiretroviral therapy in people who are doing well? And what guidelines do you need to have in place? What are the ethical implications for that? I can tell you that patients are desperate to do it. They think it would be great. But I think, you know, we have to be very, very cautious how we do that and what the implications might be. So in the last couple of minutes, I just quickly want to cover this alternative strategies for cure. Um, and there's this concept of kick and kill. Um, this is an Americanism. It certainly wasn't invented by us. And this is the idea that you take the latently infected cells, which are sort of camouflaged, they're not doing anything, you can't see them, and you force them to wake up. You make them present antigen, you make them present virus. You know, it goes against everything we think we should be doing in terms of controlling infection. But if you can make them wake up and make them become targets, then you can kill them. And this is the concept of the kick and the kill, or shock and kill. And actually, there are drugs out there that will do this. And what is interesting, they don't come from the infectious disease world, they come from the cancer world. And there's a group of drugs called the HDAC inhibitors, um, which are used in mesothelioma, in myeloma, T-cell um, lymphomas, which are very effective if you drop them in, in culture, in latently infected cell models, of forcing virus out of culture. They turn on transcription, you know, to a huge extent. Um, and they look very effective. Other classes of agents, protein kinase C agonists, look very exciting as well. Prostratin is from the bark of a tree in Samoa. Um, bryostatin is, is from a very small sort of sea cucumber. They're impossibly hard to get hold of, but if you can, again, they force virus out of, uh, to, make, to, to transcribe in latently infected cells. And these are looking very interesting. Actually, bryostatin is a drug that's currently in trials in Alzheimer to improve memory, so you know, there, there is potential to sort of think that it might be safe. How do the HDAC inhibitors work? Well, we know that when HIV is in its integrated state, it is wrapped up in its histones, and the histone tails um, determine you know, how tightly that wrapping occurs. This is my understanding of it. And the, and the lysines on those histine tails, in their state of acetylation allows transcription to occur or not. The HDAC inhibitor forces that path into a state where the HIV eventually unravels. The, the sites for sort of the various markers allow transcription to take place occurs, and therefore you see viral transcription. Can you give this to patients? Can you give this to patients with HIV, though? Is this an ethical thing to do? Remember, they're all doing well. They've got normal lifespans, and they're on therapy, and they're happy. So the FDA said to Dave Margolis, you can give one dose to eight patients and see what happens. And that's what he did. And interestingly, when you take out those latently infected cells, and he took litres, you know, effectively, he leukophoresed these patients, took billions of cells. If you look in the cells, then you can see transcription turning on, sort of five-fold increase of transcription in those latently infected cells in patients. But no change in the blood. You can't see virus coming out. There's a block somewhere. In Australia, the FDA said you can give one dose. The Australian said you can give 14. They're obviously a bit more relaxed. But, um, <laughs> so, so Sharon Lewin gave two weeks' worth of Varinostat, um, which is a... a, a one of these HDAC inhibitors to patients um, with HIV, and she found exactly the same symptom, a sort of threefold increase in transcription at the cellular level. You know, the virus was waking up, but if you looked in the blood or you looked in the actual size of the reservoir, there was no change there. There was, there was, a, there was some sort of block occurring. The next stage was the Danes have recently published this. This was the clear trial, and they used a different drug. They used panabinostat. Um, which is made by Novartis and looks very nice in myeloma. In fact, it looks so nice in myeloma, they're not giving it to any other HIV patients at the moment because they're worried about the licensing. So we're not going to know any more data for a while. But when the Danes gave panabinostat to a group of HIV-positive individuals on therapy, they saw, a, and this is about a thousand times more potent in, in the lab if you drop this in, into your, your cell cultures for HIV. Panabinostat resulted in viremia in patients on therapy. So transcription, protein expression, undoubtedly antigen presentation, and then viremia in the blood. So these, these agents and stuff were kicking these cells into life. What was interesting is the cells don't die, or they don't seem to die, which you think they might do. So you do need the kill component of the kick. And the question is, how are you going to do the kill? Where, where's that going to come from? You know, we've always struggled with the immunotherapy vaccine com component of, of HIV in, in infection. There, there is some hope that this might be different, because effectively you're dealing with a host antigen now. You're dealing with an antigen that is, is, is coming out from its integrated form. It hasn't had any time to replicate through its viral form. It is a, it is a, you can consider it like a tumour antigen almost. So there may be some, some hope that kind of the virus escapist use that have challenged us before will not be so prevalent. And we're looking sort of to combine vaccines with the kick component to see if that might work. 
which takes me on to this trial, which we're starting in the next few weeks, hopefully, in the UK. It's got, got through its, all its approvals. And this is where we take patients with primary infection, who I told you are the ones we think are most amenable to cure. They then get an HDAC inhibitor and then, get, then get a vaccine that has been developed in Oxford by Lucy Droll and Tom Hankey. And this is the idea of putting kick and kill together in patients who are on therapy with HIV to see if for the first time we can show a change in the size of the reservoir. So we're, we're starting to recruit this quite soon. It will be exciting. We should know in about a year's time or so whether there's been any impact on the reservoir. And other sites are doing this around the world as well now, starting to roll out. But this will be the first trial of actual sort of the, the kick and kill concept. So then just to very finish off the last couple of slides, you know, that's not the only thing that's out there. There's, there's a lot of exciting things on the shelf in terms of proof of concept for cure. I mentioned I bolded the zinc finger nucleases because this whole concept of gene editing, an adoptive transfer, taking your CD4 T cells, cutting them up with zinc fingers, then growing them up and putting them back in again. So they're effectively delta 32 cells. They become resistant. It looks really interesting. And there are clinical trials showing now that you can do that. You know, again, this is not scalable to you know the millions of people infected with HIV, but in terms of proof of concept that you might be able to do this, it looks very interesting. The downside of this is you smell of garlic. Because apparently if you grow cells up in DMSO, which you do and then ingest that, you, you, you become very garlicky. So, you know, I, mean, I don't know what that does for your sex life. Um, so, so where are we in terms of the future? Someone said to me, is there any light at the end of the tunnel for HIV cure? Because it's all been a bit bleak, actually, for the last year or so. Um, I, I don't, there probably isn't light at the end of the tunnel. But someone said there's light in the tunnel, which I think is probably where we are at the moment. I think we've got a feel for where we need to be going. Um, and certainly there's, 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 there's some encouraging data out there, um, and I think there's a good platform for moving forward. Um, quick plug for Cherub. So this is a collaboration of universities across the UK, Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial, UCL and King's. Investigators there working together, clinicians all working together you know, with an idea of, of, of pushing forward the cure agenda. So a little plug for there, and you can chase us up. And I'm going to stop there, because actually the data I presented is, is done by fantastic people at Peter Medawar in Oxford and elsewhere. So I think I've kept reasonable time. Thank you.